Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Hatcher. This is Psych 302 Computer Applications and Data Analysis. And we are at lecture notes for chapter 035, Shapes of Distributions. Guide overview. This guide shows how to use Jamovi to compute statistics to create plots that can be used to determine whether the frequency distribution for a quantitative variable is approximately normal, symmetrical, and mesocritic. It'll show how to use the results to determine whether distributions are positively skewed, negatively skewed, leptocritic, or platocritic. This chapter will help you develop skills you need to determine whether your data satisfy assumptions underlying parametric statistical procedures such as t-tests or ANOVA. Uh, and let me emphasize that. This is a foundational chapter with most of the statistical procedures that you'll learn about in this class, such as the t-test. There are certain assumptions that need to be met before you should go ahead with the analysis. And this chapter will show you how to analyze your data to determine whether you satisfy those assumptions. Our investigation. Imagine we've conducted research on attitudes and behavior related to health. We've developed an instrument called the Questionnaire on Eating and Exercising to measure constructs of interest. We've administered it to 260 students enrolled in a variety of psych classes at a regional state university. We've obtained usable responses from 238 participants. Files related to the, these analyses. Uh, the one uh, data set that, uh, the one file that you would need to access if you're going to replicate the things that I do in this lecture is the one called Eat Exer Data. This is the Jamovi data set that contains the 238 students' responses to the questionnaire. Therefore, it is the file that you would open in Jamovi if you wish to perform the analyses described here. Now, as is the case with most of my lectures, you're not supposed to actually do these analyses on this data set. Uh, the exercise you complete for my class will involve you analyzing a different data set, a different set of variables. Uh, this lecture that you're looking at right now is your guide. You can use it as a model for performing the analyses that you're going to perform. Uh, you won't analyze exactly the same data set that I am analyzing in this lecture. But if you were doing everything that I did in this lecture, this is where you would begin, starting Jamovi and opening the data set. This section will provide relatively brief instructions for starting Jamovi application and opening the data set that we'll analyze. It assumes you've already performed the task in the previous exercise and just need a quick refresher. For more detailed instructions on how to download a Jamovi data set from Canvas, uh, start the Jamovi application and locate the relative data set. See Lecture Notes, Chapter 025, Descriptive Statistics, especially the section headed Downloading the Jamovi data set from Canvas. Starting the Jamovi application, uh, starting a Jamovi application that's already been installed. If you're using a Windows computer, you'll start Jamovi the same way you start any application. Click Start in the lower left corner of the screen. Scroll down to the J section of the resulting list of programs, open the Jamovi folder, and click Jamovi. This should produce the Jamovi interface on your screen. On the other hand, if you are starting the browser-based, that is cloud-based version of Jamovi, if you instead plan to use the cloud-based version, you'll click the following link or paste this link into the address box of your browser. Clicking the above link will produce a dialog box that asks you to sign in either as a guest, which is free, or as a paid subscriber. Make your selection and sign in. Regardless of whether you're using the cloud-based version or the version installed on your device, the initial Jamovi interface will look pretty much the same. It'll look like the following. On page three, we have our Jamovi interface. And you learned about this in previous exercises uh, you know that this is the data spreadsheet where your data will appear. This is the results panel where your results will appear once you've done some analyses. So this is our initial uh, uh, Jamovi interface. Still on page three, about halfway down page three, using Jamova's file panel to open a data set. 
Now that the Jamovi application is open, you use the file panel to locate and open the data set that you downloaded earlier. This section shows how to do this with the cloud-based version of Jamovi, but the steps are very similar if you're instead using the installed version. You begin by clicking the file icon, which is located in the upper left corner of the Jamovi interface. This icon consists of three short vertical lines and is therefore sometimes called the air vent icon as shown below. In a perfect world, there would be the word file right here. And so you would know that that's going to open the file menu. Uh, but no, instead they use this air vent icon, the three vertical lines. Uh, do commit that to memory because we're going to use this file icon often uh, this semester in using Jamovi. So at the top of the Jamovi interface, select this air vent icon. This produces the file panel on the left side of the interface. There, select the open command as shown below. Okay, in the lecture notes, I'm on page four at the top of page four. When I clicked that air vent icon, it produced this panel. Uh, this is the file panel that lets me do things related to files. Uh, in this file panel, my next task is to click open. Clicking open um, causes some potential file locations to appear below the heading open. There, select this device as shown below. Note, if you're doing this using the installed version of Jamovi, then a browse button will appear in the panel. Uh, if so, click the browse button to open the open dialog box and use that dialog box to navigate your way to the data set that you want. To summarize, what happened was, to back up a bit, I clicked that air vent icon. It produced this file panel. In the file panel, I clicked open, and that opened the open panel. Uh, in the open panel, I selected this device, and selecting this device will result in our next step. Where am I? I'm on page four still. Bottom part of page four, um, selecting this device will cause the file upload dialog box to appear as shown below. Use that dialog box to navigate your way to the location where you've downloaded the Jamovi data file. In this example, you've navigated your way to the computer's downloads folder. In that dialog box, double click the name of the Jamovi data file, which in this case is eat Exer data as shown below. So when I clicked this device, it opened up a window that allowed me to navigate around the files and folders of my application. I remembered that when I downloaded the data set I wanted, I had by default downloaded it into my computer's downloads folder. Therefore, I selected the downloads folder and it opened up a list of the files that are in the downloads folder. What does this call out say? In the resulting file upload dialog box, navigate your way to the downloads folder or wherever you had saved your Jamovi data file. Double click the name of that data file, dot, dot, dot. And this causes the data file to appear in the Jamovi spreadsheet as shown below. You're now ready to perform some data analysis. So, Found the data set in the downloads folder, double clicked it, double clicking it causes that data set to appear here in the data spreadsheet of the Jamovi interface. So the data file opens in the Jamovi spreadsheet. You are now ready to perform some analyses. I am on page five, toward the bottom of page five. Toward the bottom of page five, the Eating and Exercising Investigation. Uh, the data set that we just downloaded and opened in Jamovi is from the questionnaire on eating and exercising. The data set created from this questionnaire contains a very large number of variables, although we'll analyze just three of them in this chapter. Three variables are described here. From my Eating and Exercising questionnaire, I'm going to analyze a variable called Healthy Diet Behavior. 
this healthy diet behavior scale indicates the extent to which a participant eats a diet that's rich in variables and free of junk food. Scores could range from one to seven. Higher scores mean you eat a healthier diet. Another variable I'll analyze is called health motivation. This health motivation scale reflects their desire to be healthy and free of medical problems. This variable is also measured using multiple items, some major rating scale. Uh, scores could range from one to seven. Higher scores mean uh, greater health motivation. And finally, exercise minutes. Exercise minutes variable indicates total minutes of aerobic exercise that the participant engages in in a typical week. So this is going to be a number, uh, this quantitative and a direct measure of minutes. It's not going to be on a seven point scale. Still here on page six, requesting descriptive statistics and plots. Requesting descriptive statistics. We'll analyze the data set that we've just opened, the one that had initially been named Eat Exer Data. Do the following. Click the Analyses tab, if necessary, to reveal the Analyses ribbon near the top of the Jamovi interface. Then click the Exploration icon, and from the result menu, select Descriptives. It's like this. In your Jamovi interface, you'll recall that you have different tabs at the top of the interface. You have a variables tab, a data tab, and so forth. The tab we want is analyses. It's probably already been selected, but in case it has not, select the analyses tab. Then uh, among the analyses icons that we see on this ribbon, uh, we'll click the one on the left called exploration, and that produces an exploration menu. From the resulting exploration menu, select descriptives. So select exploration, then descriptives. Doing so should reveal the analysis options panel for descriptives as shown below. I'm now on page seven and we're still looking at the Jamovi interface, but now we're looking at the analysis options panel for the descriptives procedure. Here we can tell Jamovi which variables we want to analyze. We can indicate which specific kinds of descriptive statistics we want to produce for those variables. Uh, what do we have highlighted? Large box on the left side of the analysis options panel contains a list of the variables in your data set. Uh, this data set is large, so you'll have to scroll down the name of variables to see all the variables it contains. And what is he talking about? He's talking about this, the large box on the left side of the interface, that is my variable list. It contains all the variables in the data set, and you have to use this uh, bar to scroll down and see the names of all the variables. Still talking about the interface, the same analysis options panel also contains a horizontal bar headed statistics. If necessary, click the arrow that appears to the left of the heading statistics to reveal the items that can be requested in the statistics section. There, check and uncheck boxes so that only the following are requested. And what's he talking about? There's a statistics bar. Yes, sure enough, there is a bar here, headed statistics. When you first open this interface, there's probably no options to select. To reveal them, you want to click this little arrow that appears to the left of the heading statistics. Uh, once you have done that, it'll produce a long list of options that you can request. And from those options, you will request these in missing standard deviation and so forth. There's more requesting histograms, QQ plots and box plots. If necessary, click the arrow on the horizontal plots bar to reveal the items that can be requested there. In the plots section, check and uncheck boxes so that they on, only the following are requested. And these are the plots we want to request as long as the options for the plots we want. When you're finished, your completed analysis options panel should resemble the left side of the following figure. I am on page nine. This is what the descriptives panel should look like. Now let's back up a little bit and make sure that you're clear on how I requested the variables that I wanted to be analyzed. 
going back to page six, back to page seven, going back to page seven is where we want to be. Uh, page seven, we have the variable list here. We have to decide which variables we want to analyze. Whatever variables we do want to analyze, we click the name for that variable, and then we click the right pointing arrow here, and that moves the variable's name from the variable list to this box headed variables. Uh, variables that appear here, those are the variables that we will analyze. Uh, then we click the little arrow to the left of statistics to reveal all the statistics that are available, and we check boxes to request the statistics that we wanted to request. This produced what we see on page nine. And now back on page nine, Scroll down some in the Jamovi interface so that I don't see the variables anymore. They're up here somewhere. Scroll down so that we'd be able to see which statistics had been requested and which plots had been requested. Doing the analysis, you'll check and uncheck boxes so that only these boxes are checked in the statistics section. You will check and uncheck boxes so that only these boxes are checked in the plots boxes. So I am still on page nine. Yes, this is page nine. Page nine shows what your Jamovi interface should look like, the analysis options panel of the Jamovi interface. Let's go to page 10. Page 10, at the top, we have a table headed descriptives. This is a table created by Jamovi when I requested the analyses that I requested. What does it say on page 10? Figure 355.15 presents a table of descriptive statistics produced by this analysis. This table is organized in a format called variables across columns. Now hold on, why do they call it variables across columns? Think of it this way. Columns run up and down, right? Think about Roman columns and Roman architecture. This is a column. Notice this column is a variable. Uh, it's the variable healthy diet behavior. We've got statistics for that variable. This column represents a different variable, health motivation variable. And this column represents a third variable, the exercise minutes column. So right now we're in an arrangement called variables across columns. Uh, unfortunately, we don't want variables across columns. APA style typically wants you to instead have variables across rows. So Rather than having a variable going up and down, we want a variable to be a row going from left to right. Therefore, one of the first things we'll do is transpose the preceding table so that it displays variables across rows rather than variables across columns. I am still on page 10. We have the section transposing the table of descriptive statistics. In the analysis options panel, just below the variable list box, is an item headed variables across columns. Click the down arrow that appears to the right of this heading as shown below. Here's the little box that begins by saying variables across columns. You click that and it produces a menu, pop down menu that appears below. From that resulting menu, select variables across rows. As soon as we make this selection, the descriptives table is transposed so that the rows of the table now represent different variables and the columns now represent different statistics. What do you mean by that? Well, let's go to page 11 and see. I'm at the top of page 11. So from the resulting menu, I selected variables across rows. Notice I've now changed this so it says variables across rows instead of variables across columns. And as soon as I did that, this table gets flipped on its side. Instantly, the rows and columns of the descriptives table are transposed. So that's one of the things that you'll do in your exercise is transpose the rows and columns of your table of descriptive statistics. We continue. I am still on page 11, about halfway down, adding your name to the results panel. Some exercises in this course will direct you to add your name to the Jamovia results panel. Here's the steps for doing this. I'm not gonna go over it in great detail. You can actually read this and follow these steps when you are doing your exercise. Basically it just involves uh, clicking this results and then uh, typing your name below the results heading. 
Let's go to page 12. Page 12 is interpreting basic descriptive statistics. In the statistics section of the Jamovi Analysis Options Panel, we had requested the mean, the median, and some other descriptive statistics for the variables being analyzed. Table of descriptive statistics produced by these requests appear below. Callout numbers such as one, this is a callout number. This is a callout number. This is a callout number. Callout numbers such as one have been added to the table to identify specific parts of the table and the corresponding explanations appear below the table. So here is the table created by Jamovi and below I explain the contents. First column on the left side of the table provides the names of the variables that we analyzed. First row is headed healthy dot behavior, so we know that row will contain statistics for healthy dot behavior scale. So under the heading one, we have the names of our variables. In this first row, we'll have statistics for the healthy dot behavior variable. Second row, we'll have statistics for health motivation variable and so forth. The second column in our table is headed in, and this column indicates sample size, number of participants who provided usable values for that variable. First row indicates we have usable responses from 238 participants for healthy that behavior. Uh, what's he talking about? Under the heading two, we have, we have the heading in, this call out number two, we have the heading in, uh, and it tells us how many people gave us usable data for each variable. Well, 238 people gave us usable data for healthy diet behavior, 238 gave us usable data for health motivation, and so forth. Let's go to the third column, the third column I talk about anyhow. It is headed mean. Uh, the next column provides the mean, that is mathematical center of the distribution for each of the four variables. Top value indicates the mean score was 4.22 for healthy diet behavior. Is that true? For healthy diet behavior, the mean was 4.22. I guess that is true. Uh, the next column provides the median score for each variable. This is under the call out number four. We have the heading median, median for each variable. Median is the middle score that divides the distribution into two equal halves with theoretically 50% of the scores above this median and 50% of the scores below it. First value in the column indicates that the median score was 4.20 for healthy dot behavior. Is that true? Median healthy dot behavior median score was 4.20. Sure enough. I am still on page 12. Bottom of page 12. We have a new section reviewing the histograms. Continues on the top of page 13. In the current analysis, the first histogram displays the frequency distribution for a healthy diet behavior variable. That plot is presented below. Uh, what do I have to say about that plot? In the histogram, in figure 340.12, horizontal axis is headed healthy diet behavior. And it contains value labels such as 2, 4, and 6. At the beginning of this chapter, you learned that scores on healthy diet behavior scale could range from 1 to 7. So it makes sense that a subset of those values, such as 2, 4, and 6, would appear as points on this horizontal axis. Horizontal axis, we have the points 2, 4, and 6. Those are the kinds of scores that are possible on my healthy diet behavior scale. The vertical axis is headed density. This is the vertical axis. Headed density, and this axis indicates the counts or simple frequencies, number of participants who displayed specific scores on healthy diet behavior. Length of the bars indicate number of participants who displayed specific scores. For example, the longest bars appeared near the middle of the distribution, indicating a large number of participants displayed scores in the middle of the scale. And sure enough, bars are longest here in the middle, so we had a lot of people that were giving getting scores of. 4, 4.2, 4 4.4. In contrast, the bar is relatively short on the far left side of the histogram, indicating few participants displayed extremely low scores, such as 1.0 and 1.2. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Bars are short here, meaning not very many people had low scores on healthy dot behavior. Uh, on the far right side of the plot, uh, bars are also short on the far right side of the plot, indicating few students gave really high scores such as 6.6 .6 or 6.8. 
And sure enough, the bars are short here. We don't have very many people giving us really high scores on healthy diet behavior. Continuing at the bottom of page 13, in the plot section of the analysis options panel, we had also checked the box headed density, and this added a density curve to the histogram. Density curve is a smooth version of the original distribution. It provides a cleaner picture of where the scores are concentrated in the sample being analyzed. Density curve in this figure confirms that most scores on healthy diet behavior appear toward the center of the scale, and the scores become less frequent as we move toward the left or the right tail. In other words, the shape of this histogram is similar to the shape of a normal distribution. Is that true? Density curve is this line. It is a smoothed out version of the shape of our distribution. And yeah, that's pretty close to a normal curve, as long as you don't look too close. That's about as close to a normal curve as we get with a real world variable such as healthy diet behavior. I continue on page 14, at the top of page 14. Uh, let's talk about that in more detail. Normal versus approximately normal distributions. Perfect normal distribution, the theoretical normal distribution, that is the perfect normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, is the bell-shaped symmetrical probability distribution. His form is described by a precise mathematical formula. The figure below illustrates the perfect normal distribution. You'll see this picture in every statistics textbook. Still on page 14, about halfway down, we can see that the distribution in this plot is symmetrical. Tail on the left side is a mirror image of the tail on the right. When conducting investigations in the real world, researchers just about never encounter variables that display theoretical perfect normal distribution. It is, after all, a theoretical distribution. However, there's such a thing as an approximately normal distribution. On the other hand, when conducting real world research, Investigators often encounter approximately normal distributions, variables that produce histograms that are bell-shaped, fairly symmetrical, and follow the basic form of the theoretical normal distribution. Histogram for healthy diet behavior presented earlier is an example of an approximately normal distribution. For convenience, it's pre presented again below. And yeah, this is healthy diet behavior it's kind of similar to that perfect normal distribution, although not quite as symmetrical, and it's got some lumps and bumps that the perfect normal distribution does not have. Related topic, skewness in distributions. In determining whether distribution is approximately normal, one of our first tasks will involve deciding whether it's symmetrical, which is usually a good thing, versus skewed, which is usually a bad thing. <clears throat> Distribution is said to be symmetrical if the left side of the distribution is a perfect mirror image of the right side. Theoretical normal distribution displayed earlier is perfectly symmetrical. Whenever distribution is not symmetrical because one tail is longer than the other, it is said to be a skewed distribution. Two types of skewness are possible. First of all, negative skew. When a distribution displays a negative skew, most observations are bunched together where the higher scores appear and a long tail extends in the direction of the lower scores. General form of negative skew is illustrated in the left panel below. This is theoretical negatively skewed distribution. Notice you have a long tail extending in the, on the left side. Uh, I tell students, imagine this is where the negative scores in the distribution are. If you have a long tail that points in the direction of the negative scores, then you've got a negatively skewed distribution. It looks like I had one of my real world variables negatively skewed too. Do I talk about that? One of the variables included in our current analysis was health motivation. The plot in the right panel of the preceding figure for the histogram for health motivation uh, shows scores obtained in the current investigation. You can see it displays negative skew. Is that true? Yes. With health motivation, most people are lumped together where the higher scores are. You have a long tail pointing in the direction of the lower scores, the more negative scores. That tells us this is a negatively skewed distribution. 
Well, if a distribution can be negatively skewed, does that mean a different distribution might be positively skewed? When a distribution displays a positive skew, most observations are bunched together where the low scores appear. Long tail extends in the direction of the higher scores. The plot on the left side of the figure illustrates general nature of a positively skewed distribution. I tell my students, if the long tail points in the direction of the higher scores, think of these as the more positive scores. That means you've got a positively skewed distribution. The right panel of the same figure illustrates a real world variable that's positively skewed. Exercise minutes. This variable reflects minutes of aerobic exercise that each participant engages in in a typical week. Histogram has a relatively long and skinny tail that extends in the direction of the higher values. That means it's positively skewed. This kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Think about how many people you know who are heavy exercisers. Probably not very many. Most of us are bunched together getting not very minutes of aerobic exercise per week. There are some people that get a lot of exercise per week, but they're few and far between, and they create this long skinny tail that points out in the direction of the higher scores. We continue. More examples, more discussion of skew. I'm one page 18 now. Hatcher's memory trick for negative versus positive skew. If the long tail points in the direction of the lower, that is the more negative values, then your distribution has a negative skew. On the other hand, if the long tail points in the direction of the higher, that is more positive values, it has a positive skew. Well, is this the way that researchers do it? Do they just eyeball uh, figures and make a decision about skew? That is one of the tactics they use to determine skew, but there's a quantitative tactic as well. There is the skewness statistic. Where am I? I'm on page 18, about halfway down. Skewness statistic indicates the degree to which a variable displays a symmetrical distribution, a distribution in which one tail is longer than the other. Uh, that is, displays an asymmetrical distribution, distribution where one tail is longer than the other. With the skewness statistic, a value of zero indicates that the distribution is perfectly symmetrical. A positive value, such as positive 2.78, indicates that it has a positive skew with long tail pointing in the direction of the higher scores. Negative values, such as negative 3.83, indicates it has a negative skew, long tail pointing in the direction of the lower scores. Larger the absolute value of the statistic, the greater the skew. Huck, 2012 points out that although there's no widely accepted criteria for evaluating skewness statistic, many investigators view the distribution as being approximately normal if the obtained value of the skewness statistic is somewhere between negative one and positive one. In the resulting descriptives table that we created with our previous analysis, the requested statistics appear below the heading skewness. And yes, when we did our analysis at the beginning of this video, we requested skewness statistics, and here they are. Skewness statistics themselves appear below the heading skewness. Under SE, we have the standard errors uh, for these skewness statistics. Here are our values. Well, what do they show? Obtained skewness statistics reported in the preceding table reveal the following. Skewness statistic for healthy diet behavior was negative 0.19. Now, is that true? Healthy diet behavior, negative 0.19. That was true. What does it mean? Technically, this value is negative, indicating the healthy diet behavior displays a slight negative skew. On the other hand, this value is also pretty close to zero, uh, the zero value that we would expect if it were perfectly symmetrical. Healthy diet behavior appears in the left panel of the figure below, just to refresh your memory. Skewness statistic was negative 0.19. The negative 0.19 is pretty close to zero. That's what we would expect with a distribution that's pretty symmetrical. Our next statistic is for health motivation. Negative 1.16, is that true? Health motivation, skewness statistic, negative 1.16, it is true. What does that indicate? 
It's a negative value confirming our conclusion that health motivation displays a negative skew. Its histogram appears in the center panel below. Sure enough, health motivation had the negative value, negative skew. And finally, skewness statistic for exercise minutes was positive 1.69. Is that true? Uh, exercise minutes, positive 1.69. It is true. As expected, it's a positive value consistent with our conclusion that exercise minutes displays a positive skew, as can be seen in the histogram on the right panel. Exercise minutes, positive skew. Well, that's skewness. Some of you have heard of skewness before, uh, but there are additional statistics that we requested to tell us about other physical characteristics of our distribution. For example, the kurtosis statistic. I'm on the bottom of page 19. Kurtosis in distributions refers to the peakedness of a frequency distribution, the extent to which the distribution is relatively peaked versus relatively flat compared to a perfect normal distribution. If a sample of scores is neither peaked nor flat relative to the normal distribution, it's described as being mesocurtic. Theoretical normal distribution presented earlier was mesocurtic. A leptocurtic distribution is a pointy distribution with a relatively high peak compared to the perfect normal curve. And a platocurtic distribution is relatively flat compared to the perfect normal curve. So, here we have a leptocurtic distribution. Uh, my mnemonic advice is imagine Superman has to leap this tall building in a single bound. Uh, leap, leptocurtic, that's my memory trick for remembering what a leptocurtic distribution is. And platocurtic distribution, flat uh, rhymes with flat. So whenever I hear the word platocurtic, I think flat distribution. In fact, I give you those very memory tricks here. Um, we don't just look at distributions, we also compute statistics that tell us whether they are leptocurtic or platocurtic. The kurtosis statistic estimates the extent to which a distribution is relatively flat versus peaked. When kurtosis statistic is zero, it indicates that it's neither peaked nor flat compared to the normal distribution. Positive values such as positive 2.34 indicates that it's leptocurtic Negative values such as negative 1.93 indicate that it's platocurtic. Huck indicates that most researchers view a distribution as being approximately normal if the kurtosis statistic is somewhere between negative 1 and positive 1. I'm at the bottom of page 20, going to the top of page 21. Results in the preceding table review the following. Kurtosis statistic for healthy diet behavior was negative 0.30. Is that true? Healthy diet behavior, negative 0.30. All things considered, we can call this distribution almost mesocurtic because negative 0.30 is almost zero. Kurtosis statistic for health motivation was positive 1.55. Positive value indicating that it was relatively peaked. And the kurtosis statistic for exercise minutes was even bigger value, 2.65. This positive value indicating it was also relatively peaked compared to the normal curve. And for uh, sake of convenience, I've reproduced those distributions below. We move to page 22. Reviewing box plots, we have a red font box here from Hatcher. What does it say? You, meaning you students, will create box plots for the exercise that you ultimately complete, but there won't be any questions related to the box plots on the multiple choice quiz that you'll take. Uh, therefore, Hatcher, you can skip to page 27. Uh, so you will create box plots, but there won't be any questions that require that you interpret them. Make a mental note that I do have a big section here on box plots so if the point comes in your future where you have to make sense of box plots, box plots, you've got the section here. We are going to skip something we do need to worry about on page 27. So let's scroll down to page 27. And that was page 26. 
I am now on page 27. Give everybody a second to catch up. Another kind of plot that is super important to statisticians and researchers, but that many students in elementary stats never heard of, is the QQ plot. This begins on page 27. And here I have examples of QQ plots. Uh, now that looks kind of bizarre. I've never seen anything like that. What are they all about? Bottom of page 27. If scores in a sample are normally distributed, the data points in a QQ plot should fall on a straight line that runs diagonally through the plot. If any dots diverge from the straight diagonal line, it indicates the distribution is not normally distributed. The more the dots diverge from the line, the greater the departure from the normal distribution. In the preceding figure, the variable comes closest to displaying a normal distribution is healthy diet behavior. The QQ plot for this variable appears in the left panel. We know that healthy diet behavior comes closest to displaying a normal distribution because most of its dots fall on the straight line that runs diagonally through the plot. What is he talking about? Let's take another look at these figures, which are on page, in the middle of page 27. Uh, the text said that healthy diet behavior comes closest to being normally distributed. And we know that because the dots come pretty close to following to falling on this line that runs diagonally through the distribution. Okay, these dots do fall pretty close to falling on that line. So I'll grant you that. When I look at the QQ plot for health motivation, these dots diverge from the line. I want to look at exercise minutes. They diverge from the line a lot as well. Does he say something about this? He does on page 28, bottom half of page 28. Relevant statistics appear below the heading skewness in the table. And here's our same skewness statistics we looked at a little bit earlier. When a distribution is perfectly symmetrical, the skewness statistic is equal to zero. The table shows that the skewness statistic was closest to zero for healthy diet behavior. Is that true? Healthy diet behavior, yeah, it has a skewness statistic of negative 0.19. That's as close to zero as you get. These two other skewness statistics are pretty far away from zero. Uh, skewness statistic is closest to zero for healthy diet behavior. This is what you would expect given the fact that the dots come closest to forming a straight line on the QQ plot for healthy diet behavior. In contrast, absolute value of the skewness statistic was substantially larger for health motivation, negative 1.16, and exercise minutes, uh, positive 1.69. These results are consistent with our observation that the dots displayed substantial deviations from the straight diagonal line in the QQ plots for both of those variables. Was that true? Sure enough, on the previous page, the dots diverge from the straight line here, so we know it's not terribly normal. Dots diverge from the straight line here, so we know that that variable is not terribly normal. I am back on page 28. Toward the bottom of page 28, summary and conclusion. Some of the most important points made in this chapter. Frequency histogram is a graph that reveals the shape of a distribution. A symmetrical distribution is one in which the tail on the left side is a mirror image of the tail on the right. In a skewed distribution, one tail is longer than the other. Kurtosis refers to the peakedness of a frequency distribution. A Q, Q plot is a graph that reveals the shape of a distribution. If the scores in the sample are normally distributed, data plots, uh, data points in a QQ plot should fall on the straight diagonal line. Um, as I recall, there's an item in your study guide that warns you that you need to remember this part. Uh, how do you know that a distribution is probably normal when you're looking at a QQ plot? The dots should fall pretty much on the straight diagonal line. Okay, Hatcher ends this lecture, and that is the end 
of my lecture notes, chapter 035, Shapes the Distributions. Once again, uh, your assignment was not to repeat the analyses exactly as I displayed them in this lecture. Instead, you will open up the exercise that is the appropriate exercise for chapter 035. You will use that, the instructions in that exercise to analyze a different data set. You'll perform the same analyses that I performed here, but you'll perform those analyses on different variables in a different uh, data set. Purpose of these lecture notes is to give you a model that you can use as a guide when you're completing that exercise. This is the end of my lecture on chapter 035, Shapes of Distributions.